How's everyone doing? Good, good. Thank you. How about you? Good. So far, so good. I actually got a lumbar laminectomy starting right now. So <laughs> <laughs> draped and timed out. Get that going, and then I'll run back over when this is done. So it'll probably be done by the time I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great. Dash, you had a big, uh, big case today, huh? Yeah, we just did this uh, big meninge. Natasha, you got a little bit of an echo. Are you playing two speakers somewhere? I'm on two accounts at once. So I can broadcast everyone. <laughs> yeah, so we broadcast live on Instagram Live um, and YouTube Live at the same time. And so uh, the Zoom participants will climb a little bit, but the majority of our listeners are actually viewing from the ease and comfort of Instagram and YouTube, which is much easier. And just so you guys know, these uh, this talk will be broadcast on, um, it'll be posted on YouTube permanently as well. Give me one okay. more second while we wait for Jason. Hold on. Hey, Dr. Sheehan, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Hi, how are you, Joshua? This can ask you. How are you? Good to, good to see you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. We're just waiting for Randy here. Hi, how are you, Joshua? Congratulations on uh, your award, and thanks for coming to present. Thank you. Hey, Jason. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, guys. So no welcome, everyone, to Tumor Talk. This is the weekly webinar we run um, in conjunction with Lenox Hill Hospital and the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, where we typically highlight recent studies in the JNO dealing with brain and spinal cord tumors. We talk about you know, the study rationale, the results, and the relevance of it. Today, we have a special edition of Tumor Talk. And I actually wanted, Jason, if you wanted to give an introduction as to who's with us today and why. Um, but we're doing an awards show, basically. You guys are all award winners. So I'll let Jason, Jason introduce y'all. Well, uh, so uh, as man, many of you know, the COVID uh, situation has changed our plans, but our intent was to have a tumor satellite meeting, and we were um, delighted to have a number of abstract award winners here who are presenting today uh, some of the basic science abstracts that they had intended to present at the tumor satellite meeting that was to be held in Miami. So I'm delighted to see um, uh, you on the, the webinar and uh, we can go, th go through the different talks. I will personally go last if we have an opportunity because I want others to be able to present and we do try to keep this pretty tightly um, confined to the 30 minute time frame. Absolutely, yeah. So why don't we just start with uh, Chiba Wayne. If you want to introduce yourself and, and give a, you know, a short you know, 10 minute 15 minute presentation basically with question time. Okay, hi. So my name is uh, Chibawanya NA. I'm a, a neuro-oncology, uh, neurosurgical oncology fellow at uh, MD Anderson. I did my residency at the UW, uh, University of Washington in Seattle. And a lot of the work that I will talk about today is uh, some of the work that I did during residency uh, during the year off to give us during residency. I'm gonna try and share my slides. Can you see that? Okay. We're good. So go into slideshow. So um, the work I'm gonna talk about is frankly a collaboration uh, between the Fred Hutch Seattle Re Children's Research Institute um, and driven by Courtney Crane, who's part of the Seattle Children's Research Institute and Catherine Brambelos, who's also part of that group. And um, it's titled Macrophages Pro Program to Secrete Interleukin-12, Induce an Anti-Tumor Immune uh, Response with Angioblastoma. And our role here 
my role and Dr. Holland's role was to assess this technology in an immunocompetent preclinical model for glioblastoma. And I'll talk about that briefly. I have no disclosures. Um, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, so CAR T cell therapies have been assessed in glioblastoma and have very limited efficacy. And part of the reason for this is that you, they're specific for a particular antigen. And so what glioblastoma does during recurrence is it downregulates that antigen. And so the CAR T cell becomes ineffective. Um, so we're thinking of other ways to actually uh, uh, use a, a, an immune cell to actually target uh, a, a tumor. And one of them is a tumor associated macrophage and it makes up about 30% of glioblastoma. Um, TAMs have a pro-tumor phenotype typically which suppresses T cell infiltration. But we and others, including Joanna Joyce, Ganesh Rao, uh, uh, and others have shown that CSFR1 inhibitors, anti-PD-1 inhibitors, anti-PD-1 inhibitors can actually polarize macrophages to become more anti-tumor. But these things are short-lived. And so we started thinking of other ways to uh, uh, polarize macrophages long-term. One of the ways we thought about was IL-12. IL-12 is a cytokine that's part of a seminal event that's involved in macrophages initiation of an interferon gamma-induced T cell recruitment. Many clinical trials have looked at this, looked at the safety and efficacy of IL-12 for cancer, but it's been terminated due to toxicity and poor IL-12 pharmacokinetics. One recent trial though shows promise. It was done in melanoma in about 38 patients where they actually put in an IL-12 encoding plasmid and electroporated it into the melanoma lesions. And they found number one, no toxicities. Objective responses, um, overall responses were about 35.7% with complete uh, regression of lesions in about 18% of patients. 46% of patients who had uh, with uninjected lesions actually expressed experienced regression of at least one of those lesions. And 25% had a net regression of all untreated lesions. And this is particularly important because it indicates the abscopal effect. Post-treatment analysis showed T-cell infiltration and upregulation of uh, transcript associated with activation of T-cells. But importantly, interferon gamma gene expression was involved in uh, 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 stratifying patients who actually benefited from this therapy, but not patients who uh, showed progressive disease um, as treatment went on. So we hypothesized that genetically engineering macrophages to secrete IL-12 could sustain an inflammatory microenvironment in glioblastoma. We know we can't do electroporation. It's just not technically feasible at this stage in glioblastoma patients. So we started thinking of other ways to actually get IL-12 secreted in a titratable fashion uh, within glioblastoma. And the technology that Dr. Crane came up with was deriving monocytes from patients, differentiating those monocytes into macrophages, and then using a lentibower vector outside of the patient uh, to instill expression of IL-12 into those macrophages. And this transcript has several components. It had a CD CD19 component, which is a truncated CD19 receptor that allows us to track exogenously administered macrophages, but also um, and get rid of them by using CAR T cells targeted against CD19 if we needed to get rid of them. There's a T2A transactivation domain that allows these two proteins to be cleaved so they're not going together. There's the IL-12, which is our actual payload, but also you could put in more payloads. Um, Dr. Crane showed that you could actually express antibodies to PD-1, PD-L1, uh, and CTLA-4. And so we tested this um, 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 transcript and these macrophages expressed in CD19 or CD19 with IL-12 and saw that our transduction efficiencies were pretty good, over 80%. And we also looked at the production of IL-12 long-term in these macrophages and found that they were sustained um, over a month, but then dwindled after a month. As you can see, over two to three months, they eventually went to zero in terms of IL-12 production. And so we checked to see whether they actually persist in vivo. This is in vivo setting using a U87 model. And as you can see from day negative one all the way to day 19, in GFP and luciferase tagged macrophages expressing IL-12, you can see expression up until this day. And this is again, sustained over 20 days intracranially. In a flank tumor, you can also see that over a 22 day period, these macrophages are persistent, suggesting that if we can keep them persistent and continue to recruit T cells, we could potentially exact an anti-tumor response. So we tested whether IL-12 secreted by these uh, genetically engineered macrophages could actually activate T cells, because that's the whole, hopefully the whole point of this project. Um, and so we looked at T cell activation markers, early markers, CD98, and uh, late stage markers, CD25, and found that just the presence of macrophages actually activate those markers in T cells. But then when we looked at interferon gamma secretion from the T cells, we found that only IL-12 associated macrophages, genetically engineered macrophages, induced interferon gamma secretion from T cells. And these T cells, reminder, were derived from the same patients those uh, monocytes were derived from. 
And we also stained for interferon gamma and found that interferon gamma is also secreted by those uh, T cells, indicating that IL-12 secreted by the genetically engineered macrophage was activating these T cells in vitro. We took this model in vivo and injected U87 uh, cell lines with several doses of these IL-12 secreting genetically engineered macrophages and found that although it didn't reach statistical significance, there was some survival benefit to inject in this particular dose of uh, IL-12 secreting genetically engineered macrophages. But importantly, this dose actually caused a delay in tumor growth, as you can see here, relative to the other doses, including control, indicating that this was actually slowing tumor down directly in the U87 human xenograft model. But this is an immunotherapy. What about an immunocompetent model? And so this is where we came in and we took the system and we looked at it in a mouse model, um, an immunocompetent mouse model with a fully competent immune system. And we induced two tumors in the animal's brain. And the reason for this, we wanted to assess the, bi the bilateral effects of this tumor, of this, this treatment, but also look at the abscopal effect on the other side, which they found in the melanoma model in patients. And when we dissected this tumor, we looked at the tumor that we treated with IL-12, and we looked at the tumor that we did not treat on the other side of the brain, uh, we found that in the tumor that we treated, we saw a predominance of CD8 increase, CD8 positive T cell infiltration into this tumor. But in a tumor that we did not treat, we saw more CD4 infiltration into this tumor, as you can see here, indicating that it was some adaptive uh, uh, immunity um, associated with treatment by uh, mouse uh, IL-12 secreting genetically engineered macrophages. And finally, we looked at the tumor to find out what may be mediating this recruitment of T cells. And so we induced, again, a unilateral glioma in an immunocompetent mouse model. And we treated with our IL-12 secreting gems, collected and fixed the brain and ran a nanostring experiment. And what we found is that there was increased expression of interferon gamma stimulator genes, indicating that interferon gamma, just like we saw in the melanoma model in the patients, uh, was recruiting T cells, uh, potentially to exact an anti-tumor effect in, in our preclinical model. So in conclusion, human and mouse genetically engineered macrophages provide an alternative to CAR T cells. In this case, they are not antigen specific, they're antigen agnostic. Um, they secrete titratable levels of IL-12, which induce inflammation within the glioblastoma microenvironment, which is a proof of concept. We're just we're conceptualizing this, that we could use a different cell to do this. IL-12 genetically engineered macrophages activate mouse and human T cells in vitro, and we think that it's interferon gamma mediated. Mouse interleukin-12 gems also induce innate and adaptive immune responses against treated, which we think are interferon gamma mediated and untreated adjacent glioblastoma, which we suspect is the abscopal response. And finally, I didn't show this data, but human interleukin-12 genetically injured macrophages actually induce tumor cell death in ex vivo human tumor slice cultures, indicating that, and this is in the absence of T cells, which indicates that these macrophages actually do have intrinsic anti-tumor activity independent of the recruitment of T cells. And so going forward, what we're doing is we're looking at preclinical studies, looking at dose escalation, toxicity, survival, development of resistance. We're also looking at the ability for these macrophages to maintain intrinsic functions like I just talked about, like phagocytosis, antigen presentation, chemokinocytokine production. We're looking at the ability for these genetically engineered macrophages to synergize with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we're also looking at flow cytometry analysis to look at what subset of immune cells are actually mediating this effect in the treated and untreated side of the brain. And so I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people. This was not a technology that came out of one lab. It was a technology that came out of several labs and several collaborators. Uh, Catherine Brundless is essentially, and Dr. Crane were the champions of this technology. We, we helped assess its effects um, in an immunocompetent mouse model to prove that it could potentially work for glioblastoma. This was collaborative between Seattle Children's, University of Washington Medical Center Neurological Surgery Department and Fred Hutch. I also would like to thank the tumor section um, for this award. Uh, as well as WANS. And I also want to thank the Journal of Neurosurgery, specifically Dr. D'Amico and Dr. Sheehan for actually, uh, for inviting me to give my uh, uh, talk and talk about my research, which I'm excited about. Um, and I also want to thank my funding agencies, including the NIH and the R25 that I received during my research here. Thank you. That was great, Chief. thank you. Yeah, this, this is incredible work and, and obviously uh, award worthy. I only wish that we could have uh, uh, had exposure uh, for you at, at the Miami meeting. But in many ways, if our attendance on this webinar is uh, representative of past webinars, you may have a bigger audience here than you would have had in, in Miami. Yeah, so, thank you. Chief, I mean, t tell me, you know, the viewers who, who tune in here, they range from medical students all the way through other professionals. Yeah. Tell me, how, what's the relevance of this moving down? What are the next steps? How do you, 
let people understand this who are not necessarily basic science researchers. What do you say? Yeah, so it's, um, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. And I try to do that, you know, because like you said, our audience is not just, you know, a, a, a scientist audience. Um, I think that the next step is we need, to, we need to sort out the toxicity because you're putting in a genetically manipulated cell into a, a tumor microenvironment. And so the next step for us is to figure out the toxicity in a preclinical setting. Um, which we're working on right now. Once we've sorted out the toxicity, sort of corollary to a phase one clinical trial, um, we can start thinking about efficacy, which is sort of whether this actually improves survival. And the reason we're pushing for this is because there are several immunotherapeutic agents that are out there right now. And what typically happens with, immun with immunotherapy is the tumor downregulates the target of the immunotherapy long-term. And so you need to start thinking of ways that are to, to, to engineer cells that the tumor is used to that doesn't really recognize a specific antigen because the tumor can't downregulate it. You need to produce something that is very, very agnostic to antigen. And it recruits a lot of tumor immune cells like T cells. So one way to do that is to genetically engineer these macrophages to make IL-12. And so our next step is to test whether it's actually safe to do that. And we'll do the toxicity and then do the survival studies. And then hopefully if those pan out and we see an efficacy, a survival advantage, then we have to start thinking about safe ways to introduce it into the clinic, into patients. And so that's our goal, obviously, long-term, is to introduce it into patients with good cholesterol. Yeah, I think uh, great study, great beginning to hopefully a long road of uh, award-winning research for you. So, Thank you, Randy. Great job. Thank you. I I'm, I I'm intrigued by the, one of the points he made it towards the end, just the potential synergies that this could have with immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are, are obviously being explored uh, pretty significantly in the realm of, of not just uh, primary brain tumors, but secondary brain tumors, including brain metastasis, which are, are frequently employed um, for. But uh, I, I wonder if you might expand a little bit on your thoughts about the potential synergism there uh, with immune checkpoint inhibitors, I think it, it, uh, for the audience. That Absolutely. That's, that's actually one area that we're excited about. And the reason for that is Immune checkpoint inhibitors have had very mixed results in glioblastoma and some metastatic diseases. They're very sensitive, and melanoma is very sensitive to this, but other yeah. metastatic diseases are not as sensitive. And one of the reasons why a lot of tumors, in my opinion, are not sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibitors is that they're, they're what we call the cold tumor. So glioblastoma is an example of a cold tumor that doesn't have a lot of immune cells that are ready to attack the tumor right away. And one thought that's been proposed is that you could prime the tumor microenvironment to make it hot first and then administer the immune checkpoint inhibitors to see what happens. And one way to do that, we've shown this, is with radiation. You could radiate the tumor, cause inflammation, recruit immune cells, and then give the checkpoint inhibitors, which actually target those immune cells to keep them active. You could do that with radiation. You could do that with oncolytic viruses, which is what I'm working on right now um, as a fellow in Dr. Lang's lab at MD Anderson. But you could also do that, as you can see, and we're hoping with IL-12 secreting macrophages, because we expect and we hope that by priming these tumors, by priming glioblastoma, we could make them more um, immunogenic, we can make them more inflammatory, and hopefully be susceptible to checkpoint inhibitors. Great job. Great Thank explanation. You. We really appreciate you being here. Thank um, you. And you, we're going to keep you so much. through. Thank you. Obviously, a ton of questions could be asked, but Yashua, why don't you go ahead and set up your slides and we'll get moving through. Sure. And, and Joshua, your, your presentation also very uh, award-worthy and uh, award-winning. Uh, I understand the title of that was uh, Glioma-Induced Alterations in, in, in uh, uh, Fecal Short-Chain Fatty Acids and Neurotransmitters. So I've, I, again, we wish we could have had you present in person in Miami at the a satellite meeting. I'll put in a plug while, we're, while you're loading up your slides that our intent is to have the next satellite meeting in Austin uh, in the fall 2020. One, so I hope to see you both there with with continuations or expansions of, of your award-winning research already. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see, uh, can you guys see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Randy, congratulations for all the great work that, that you've done and Dr. Sheehan for allowing us to present our work. I'm at UT Houston. I've been here almost five years. I trained at UT Houston and then I did a fellowship at Sloan Kettering uh, in, 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 neuro in surgical neuro-oncology. This is some work that we've been doing over the last two to three years. And um, I'm gonna just touch on a few concepts as this is sort of a different research that the neurosurgical community may not be very familiar and talking about the microbiome. 
which is collectively the terms of trillions of microorganisms that live in and on us. And in reality, the human GI tract harbors millions of microorganisms. In fact, 99% of our genes are microbial, and this is how we, we look. And the gut microbiome plays a very important role in intestinal metabolism, antigen diversity, and immunity. The gut-brain axis has been defined recently, and it's a bi-directional communication that integrates neural, hormonal, and immunological signals. And the microbiome will communicate with uh, one another by releasing many molecules from all these bacteria, such as short-chain fatty acids, cathecholamines, neurotransmitters, and these communicate via vagal afferents. And these short-chain fatty acids are almost exclusively derived from bacterial metabolism in the gut and have been implicated in many diseases such as Alzheimer's, stroke, such as butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And the microbiome and, and these metabolites have been shown to confer susceptibility to some uh, CNS diseases and recently in cancer and may potentially influence the response to therapies such as chemotherapies or immune therapies. Recent studies have demonstrated how certain microbial uh, strains will affect survival, and particularly in melanoma and lung cancer, whenever they're treated with immunotherapy, identifying responders versus non-responders according to their particular microbiome signature. And the role of fecal metabolites and the microbiome in CNS malignancy, particularly in gliomas, have not been explored. And the goal of the study is to explore alterations in, in fecal short-chain fatty acids and neurotransmitters and we use a glioma mouse model as well as a preliminary human uh, glioma cohort. We hypothesized that glioma growth may induce changes in the fecal composition of various metabolites, including neurotransmitters. This is sort of a methodology. And as you can see on the image, we use animal experiments, four groups, C57, BL6 uh, mice. We implanted with GL261 uh, cells and we collected stool samples from the mice at various time points. Before the implantation, we let the tumor grow, and then before randomizing the mice to either a saline group or oral timozolamide, which is the most common alkylating agent used for glioma, and then we collected a sample at the end. For humans, we collected samples uh, before surgery, and we use household controls for the control samples. And the fecal microbiome was assessed with standard techniques for DNA, DNA bacterial uh, genes with 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing and the metabolites and the neurotransmitters via target metabolomic profiling in mice and humans. And this is uh, some of the results, as you can see, some changes in fecal metabolites in mice following glioma growth with either saline or temozolamide. On panel A on the left, you can see, this is the first sample compared to the last sample after the tumor grew when they were receiving saline we can appreciate many metabolites that are increased significantly and at least 12 that are decreased. So these are the most important short chain fatty acids uh, that are produced by these bacteria. And many of these have been implicated in uh, release of neurotransmitters such as serotonin that then would uh, connect to the brain. And on the right side, you can see that in the setting of temozolamide, we barely see any changes in these uh, metabolites. When we're looking at the fecal microbiome in the mice in the same model with either saline or temozolamide, as you can see, there's four box plots looking at the relative abundance. And this is sort of the analysis that we do for uh, microbiome where we look at the abundance of the bacteria at different levels. This is at the phylum level, the genus level. You can see compared to the baseline sample, after the tumor grew, there's changes in many uh, bacteria such as Firmicutes, Bacteroides, which are the most common in the human GI tract, and their corresponding genus like Acromantia and, and Bacteroides. And as you can see in the setting of Temozolamide, these changes are not seen. These are some of the differences in fecal metabolites in glioma patients and control. This is very preliminary data, preliminary data that we had where you can see compared to controls, there's significant decrease in 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid and norepinephrine. And this is one of the metabolites of serotonin. And as you can see here, the relative abundance is also decreased compared to controls. More importantly, when we, we look at the, those metabolites and neurotransmitters in mice, we can also see on the left side, the following glioma growth, we see similar changes with significant decrease in the levels of these neurotransmitters. 
But when, when the mice are treated with timozolamide, we no longer see this significance. In conclusion, these findings demonstrate the interplay between glioma and the gut-brain axis in both mice and humans. There are several metabolites that are differentially expressed in mice following tumor growth. Norepinephrine and 5-HIA are significantly decreasing humans with glioma in mice. And we believe that the modulation of these metabolites is driven by glioma feedback as temozolamide treatment, which limits glioma growth, abrogates the effects of glioma on, on the mice experiments. Obviously, further work is required to identify the pathways within the microbiome gut brain axis that could potentially influence and promote the changes in fecal metabolites so that we can elucidate those pathways to allow therapeutic strategies to limit glioma growth by either having an effect on the tumor through the immune system or by boosting other therapies such as previously mentioned uh, immunotherapies and potentially for isolated depletion or reconstitution of, spe of specific taxa such as we do with fecal microbiome transplants or with uh, probiotics. And I, I can't thank all of my collaborators from UT Houston, many institutions, and some of these work is just recently came out and we have very exciting work coming up uh, very soon. And this is my uh, email. If anybody has any, any thoughts, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Joshua, thanks. So interesting. Um, do you think that this has anything to do with gliomogenesis or do you think this is something that's, uh, uh, you know, glioma kind of progressive issue or treated treated glioma issue. Yeah, I don't I don't think it has to do with uh, gliomogenesis. Certainly, some cancers have been have been related to particular microbes and viruses, but I, I believe this could potentially be due to the uh, uh, breakage of the blood brain barrier and the uh, gut brain axis that then has an effect, and the effect may be bi bidirectional, either up or down. But I think there's there's a lot to learn from this. This this is a hot topic in other cancers, and certainly there's very good data from uh, other diseases that, that that this makes a difference. Yeah. So you haven't changed your diet at all based on this? I just you know a little more healthy, uh, no more uh, chicken fingers between cases. So. <laughs> yeah, I I think this is really out of the box. Uh, uh, thinking and uh, I commend you for it. I think that it's, you know, we, we cannot help but think that uh, as neurosurgeons, we're just so isolated on, on uh, the brain, but the interplay between the brain and the rest of the body and opportunities to uh, affect some therapeutic benefits. Uh, obviously, we use Temidar in, in other uh, settings beyond uh, uh, glioblastoma in some instances for, for uh, uh, more aggressive meningiomas and, and for uh, brain metastasis uh, and even for certain types of pediatric uh, tumors. So I wonder uh, the extent that, you know, that, that those um, the changes could also be explored in, in, in those disease states. And, and there may be an interplay there too. Uh, fascinating work and, and uh, really thinking out of the box. Thank you so Definitely. much for the invitation. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Jason, you want to go ahead? We're running a little short on time, but we'll go. We'll go post a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think in the interest of time, I think we probably. I mean, I'm happy uh, to present, but I'm also happy to present at a future point. I wanted to highlight the work of others, and more importantly, I think uh, just in brief, uh, I'll put in a plug that we did publish our work in Cytodynamic Therapy and Journal of Neurooncology. I encourage everyone and uh, everyone, and certainly the two outstanding investigators. My only, my, my only reservation on your last talk was uh, that it wasn't published in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, but please, <laughs> please, we have seen uh, uh, a uh, nearly 45% increase in submissions this year to Journal of Neuro-Oncology that comes on top of double digit increases annually in submissions to Journal of Neuro-Oncology over the last uh, two and a half to three years since I've been editor in chief. It does speak to the increasing competition of, of um, submissions to the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, but I dare say that the work that you both have presented is high caliber and, and uh, uh, truly, I think, uh, uh, the kinds of publishable grade materials that we would hope to see in Journal of Neuro-Oncology. We are uh, uh, publishing more and more and more basic and translational science and, and I'm delighted to see that uh, 
you know, work from my lab and, and hopefully work from other labs uh, such as yours and the ones uh, uh, of audience members that are on this will find their, their way in their home into the Journal of Neuro-Oncology. It is uh, our intent to publish uh, cutting edge research, uh, not just clinical, but also basic science and translational. So I'll put in a plug to read the article and without that, uh, I think I, you know, the slides that I would have would put us well into the uh, 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 time frame where we'd be well over time. You know what, Jason, I'll add to your plug. I think we actually previously on Tumor Talk discussed the Sun on Dynamic Therapy uh, publication. And so if people want to do a deep dive into our YouTube, they can actually see a, uh, an in-depth discussion of it. I think we've, we've brought it up. Yeah. Yeah, so that uh, actually, uh, I'll, I'll make one correction. So that work was done in collaboration with Francesco Prada, and that was work on on a uh, different type of sound sensitizer. And the work that was was presented as part of this tumor section satellite meeting was on yet a different sound sensitizer. We're exploring sonodynamic therapy, which is a coupling of of high frequency targeted focus ultrasound with uh, with different sound sensitizers. And so this is yet a separate uh, publication, but you'll find them both if you search under Journal of Neuro-Oncology and we'll have more discussions about focus ultrasound, no, no doubt. But yeah, I definitely. think I'm really impressed, truly, truly impressed uh, by the work that was presented here today. And I hope that both of you will be on the podium uh, in, in the, at the next uh, tumor satellite meeting. I really do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys for coming along. Really great work. And, Thank uh, you, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan, guys. We're going to take off next week, if it's okay with everyone. Uh, we'll be back on the 15th. So stay tuned. Keep tuning in. Hope to see you guys back real soon with full publications so in the JNF. Happy Labor Day to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, everyone.